Hello. Today I'll be discussing an approach to chronic dyspnea. For the purposes of this approach, I'll be arbitrarily considering chronic dyspnea as any illness lasting at least four weeks. Keep in mind, however, that just about any cause of chronic dyspnea has the potential to present more acutely than this. For the diagnostic framework, unlike the video on acute dyspnea, which categorized etiologies by physiologic mechanism, for this one, I'll be more conventionally categorizing them based on organ system, with the first one predictably being pulmonary. We can divide the lungs into five functional components, the pleura, the airways, the alveoli, the interstitium, and the pulmonary vessels, which makes coming up with individual etiologies much easier. A cause of chronic dyspnea in the pleura is a chronic pleural effusion, which has its own diagnostic framework and workup. But in the US, the most common cause of a chronic effusion large enough to cause dyspnea would be malignancy. In other parts of the world, tuberculosis would be also a major consideration. In the airways, COPD is the major etiology. Asthma is included here as well, though the episodic nature of asthma usually distinguishes it from the other etiologies in the framework. In the alveoli, falls chronic pneumonia. When chronic pneumonia is infectious, it is most commonly fungal or myc mycobacterial, rather than due to a so-called typical bacteria, unless we're talking about a lung abscess, in which case both the typical and anaerobic bacteria need to be considered. The interstitium includes, obviously, interstitial lung disease, such as hypersensitivity pneumonitis and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, among many others. And finally, under the pulmonary vessels, there is pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension can be a primary disorder seen with both familial and idiopathic forms, or it can be secondary to heart failure, chronic pulmonary emboli, autoimmune disease, sarcoidosis, or any chronic lung disease associated with hypoxemia, including the aforementioned COPD and ILD. Pulmonary arterial venous malformations, or AVMs, can also cause chronic dyspnea. The next category in the framework is cardiovascular. As with the lungs, the heart can also be subdivided into five functional components, the pericardium, the myocardium, the valves, the conduction system, and the coronary vessels. From these components, the etiologies are easy to deduce. In the pericardium, there is a form of pericarditis not called chronic pericarditis, but rather constrictive pericarditis. Constrictive pericarditis is a condition in which the pericardium becomes fibrosed and inelastic, occurring in about 2% of patients who have had an episode of acute pericarditis. Although it's a relatively rare condition, I include it here because it's a diagnosis that's frequently missed as patients present similarly to those with more conventional heart failure, except they don't respond to heart failure treatment. Under myocardium is any cause of heart failure. In the US, the most common causes of heart failure are ischemia, valvular heart disease, and inadequately controlled hypertension. Any valvular disease, if severe enough, can cause chronic dyspnea, either from causing heart failure, as just mentioned, or less commonly by itself without having induced discernible changes in the myocardium. With the conduction system, either chronic brady or tachyarrhythmias can lead to chronic dyspnea. The dyspnea in this case could be episodic, as in paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, or it can be constant, as in tachycardia-mediated cardiomyopathy that can occur in patients who are persistently in any tachyarrhythmia for weeks on end. And last, as was already alluded to, coronary artery disease can also lead to chronic dyspnea. This can be episodic, non-positional dyspnea, not associated with volume overload, in which case the dyspnea is directly caused by ischemia and is known as an anginal equivalent. This is a problem of only the coronary arteries and should be treated the same as exertional chest pain from coronary artery disease. On the other hand, the dyspnea here can be positional and associated with volume overload, in which case it's likely due to ischemia-related heart failure, which is a problem of both the arteries and the myocardium. Such patients need to be treated concurrently for both the coronary disease and the heart failure. By this point, you may have already identified a problem with dividing up the heart and lungs into functional components. Although it helps to remember the etiologies, subcategorization of the etiologies can be artificial, 
since there is so much interrelatedness. COPD and ILD cause pulmonary hypertension. Chronic pneumonias and heart failure can be associated with pleural effusions. Coronary disease, valvular disease, and arrhythmias can cause heart failure, and so forth. But I still think it greatly aids in simply remembering possible etiologies that should be under consideration. The last category in the framework is a miscellaneous category. Here we have anemia, which usually has to be at least moderate in severity to be the primary cause of dyspnea. Although there is no specific cutoff, I don't think that I've personally seen a case of chronic dyspnea occurring in a patient whose hemoglobin was above 8 grams per deciliter who did not have an additional contributing factor. Neuromuscular diseases can also cause chronic dyspnea, such as multiple sclerosis, ALS, and spinal cord injury. There is kyphoscoliosis, in which a skeletal deformity prevents the patient from taking adequate breaths. Renal failure can cause chronic dyspnea if it leads to significant volume overload. And just plain old obesity is here too, particularly when combined with deconditioning. I don't know of any specific statistics regarding the relative prevalences of these etiologies, but in my experience in the United States, heart failure and COPD have been the most common causes of chronic dyspnea that I've encountered. When it comes to assessing a patient with chronic dyspnea, in the history, key parts of the HPI will be the timing and precipitance of the dyspnea. For example, is it episodic or constant, and is it positional, usually meaning does it worsen when a patient lies down, a symptom known as orthopnea. A related symptom with the unfortunate formal name nocturnal paroxysmal dyspnea refers to the situation in which a patient awakes suddenly from sleep, gasping for air, and usually has a desire to walk around the room and, and even open a window to let in fresh air. This latter symptom, abbreviated PND, is particularly associated with heart failure. Regarding whether the dyspnea is exertional, that turns out to be an unhelpful feature since dyspnea from any cause usually worsens with exertion. Other things to consider in taking the history of present illness include the concurrent presence of chest pain, palpitations, leg swelling, cough, hemoptysis, or changes in weight, either up or down. In the past medical history, obviously pay particularly close attention to cardiac and pulmonary disease and cardiovascular risk factors, but also consider a history of immunosuppression, such as HIV, recent chemotherapy, chronic steroid use, immunosuppressive medications for organ transplant recipients, and a hereditary immunodeficiency. Ask about their general medication history, as there are certain meds that are associated with the development of conditions in the diagnostic framework, such as amiodarone, leading to ILD. In the social history, ask about smoking, which is a cardiovascular risk factor and obviously predisposes the patient to COPD. Also ask about alcohol and drugs, particularly stimulants, which will predispose the patient to heart failure, arrhythmias, and pulmonary hypertension. And ask whether the patient has had any other exposure history related to animals, their occupation, their hobbies, or recent travel. Moving on to the exam, in addition to routine vitals, also measure an ambulatory oxygen saturation, which is just an O2 sat after the patient has been walking around for a few minutes. The physical exam should otherwise focus on the heart and lungs, which could include a bedside ultrasound looking at the overall left ventricular function and the appearance of the IVC. An extremity exam should also be performed looking predominantly for lower extremity edema, but also looking for clubbing, which can be a sign of lung cancer or severe pulmonary fibrosis. A basic neuro exam focusing on muscle strength is also indicated in most patients. Key labs when working up chronic dyspnea is predominantly a CBC to rule out anemia as either the primary cause or as a contributing factor. Consider sending a BNP, which stands for B-type natriuretic peptide, if the history is suggestive of heart failure though there is some debate as to how diagnostically helpful the BNP is. Consider a chemistry panel to rule out renal failure in a patient presenting with volume overload. Additional diagnostics include a chest x-ray and ECG, both of which should be ordered in any patient presenting with chronic dyspnea. If the etiology remains uncertain at this point, 
consider an echocardiogram to evaluate for heart failure, valvular disease, and pulmonary hypertension, and consider spirometry if the history and exam is suggestive of either asthma or COPD. From this initial evaluation, a diagnosis will usually be possible, although unfortunately, it's difficult to display all of the information in a single algorithm or table as I do for most of these videos. So instead, let's go through the possible diagnoses one at a time in a similar order to the pr presentation in the framework. For example, unilateral dullness to percussion and decreased breath sounds, along with a large pleural effusion on chest X-ray, is obviously indicative of that diagnosis, which should prompt a diagnostic and therapeutic thoracentesis. If the patient has a chronic cough, smoking history, decreased breath sounds on exam, hyperinflation on chest X-ray, and an obstructive pattern on spirometry, that is highly suspicious for COPD. COPD is diagnosed definitively in a patient with an obstructive pattern on PFTs and either a chronic cough or radiographic evidence of emphysema. If the patient has a chronic cough, weight loss and fevers, has tuberculosis risk factors, is currently immunosuppressed or has been recently, and has focal lung findings on exam and or the chest x-ray, consider chronic infectious pneumonia. Whether you work them up for a fungal infection, mycobacterial infection, or both, will depend upon the patient's risk factors for each and the specific radiographic pattern, for which a chest CT is sometimes ordered. If the patient has a significant exposure history, such as animals, occupational inhalations, or potentially causative medications, has diffuse fine crackles on exam, and diffuse interstitial opacities on chest x-ray, this of course suggests interstitial lung disease. The next step is to get a chest CT and full pulmonary function tests, which includes spirometry, lung volumes, and a diffusing capacity of carbon monoxide, known as a DLCO. Keep in mind that many patients with ILD actually will not have a specific exposure history. If the patient has a loud pulmonic component of the second heart sound on exam, large pulmonary arteries on chest X-ray, and high right ventricular systolic pressures on echo, that last finding is more or less diagnostic of pulmonary hypertension. Some doctors prefer to confirm the presence of pulmonary hypertension with a right heart cath during which the pulmonary artery pressures can be directly measured, but this is not universally done. Other diagnostic steps taken at this point include a chest CT, full pulmonary function tests, a VQ scan, which is the preferred test for chronic thromboembolic disease instead of a CT angiogram. Also, in select patients, consider autoantibodies for rheumatologic diseases that are associated with pulmonary hypertension, though most such autoantibodies have poor specificity, leading to a high false positive rate if they are ordered indiscriminately. Moving to the heart, constrictive pericarditis is an infamously challenging diagnosis to make. It causes the same signs and symptoms as conventional heart failure, but also can cause unique findings in a minority of affected patients, such as a pericardial knock on auscultation, which is an early diastolic sound similar to an S3, Kussmaul sign, which is a lack of inspiratory drop in JVP, and pericardial calcifications on chest X-ray. There also may be a number of relatively nuanced findings on echocardiogram. Next steps at this point include either a CT scan or MRI to better characterize the pericardium and pericardial space, and consideration can be given to a right heart cath if the diagnosis remains uncertain. If the patient has orthopnea, PND, and weight gain, along with elevated JVP, diffuse coarse crackles, symmetric leg edema, an elevated BNP, cardiomegaly on chest X-ray, and plus or minus reduced ejection fraction on echo, that all suggests heart failure. Since ischemia is the most common cause of heart failure in the developed world, a newly made diagnosis will usually prompt either a stress test or skipping directly to cardiac catheterization, depending on the situation. If pathologic murmurs and valve dysfunction seen on echo rules in the presence of valvular heart disease, the next step should be to determine if secondary heart failure is present. However, also consider whether or not the valvular disease is a consequence of primary heart failure, 
This is most commonly observed when left ventricular volume overload results in stretching of the mitral annulus, leading to the development of a functional and reversible mitral regurgitation. If the patient reports palpitations and or has a significant arrhythmia on ECG, the latter is obviously diagnostic of the arrhythmia, though it will usually not be immediately clear if it's the primary cause of the patient's dyspnea. Depending on the specific arrhythmia seen and its severity, additional workup could include an echocardiogram, if not already done, to look for a tachyrhythmia-mediated cardiomyopathy and or an ambulatory ECG monitor to see what the patient's arrhythmia burden is like. As with the relationship between valvular disease and heart failure, arrhythmias can both cause heart failure and be caused by heart failure. If the patient has exertional chest pain, cardiovascular risk factors, and evidence of possible ischemia on ECG, consider whether the dyspnea could be primarily from the ischemia and not necessarily heart failure. Although the next step of an ischemia evaluation will still be the same. If there is severe anemia on the CBC, that should prompt a workup for the anemia and consideration of a diagnostic and therapeutic transfusion. The diagnostic component of the transfusion refers to seeing if the dyspnea improves following administration of blood. If it does not, it suggests that the anemia is not a major contributor, irrespective of its severity. Before administering such a transfusion, be sure that the patient is not already volume overloaded as a contributing factor to the dyspnea, as transfusing a dyspneic and hypervolemic patient often makes the problem worse. If the patient has unexplained muscle weakness on exam and unexplained low lung volumes, consider neuromuscular disease. A workup for that includes measurement of the vital capacity and maximum inspiratory and expiratory pressures, which are measured by handheld equipment usually by respiratory therapists. If the lung tests are consistent with respiratory muscle weakness, further workup will depend upon the patient's history and any patterns in the remainder of the neural exam. If the exam and chest x-ray show significant kyphoscoliosis, that's going to be diagnostic of that condition, but full PFTs will be necessary to tell if it's the primary cause of the patient's dyspnea. Renal failure will be ruled in or out by a chemistry panel, and finally, if the workup from the initial evaluation fails to reveal any abnormalities aside from the patient's obesity, consider whether the obesity combined with deconditioning is the primary cause. That was the approach to chronic dyspnea. Key takeaway points. There are many causes of chronic dyspnea, but in the US, heart failure and COPD are the most common. In addition to history and exam, the most important initial diagnostic tests are a CBC, chest x-ray, ECG, plus or minus an echocardiogram, and plus or minus spirometry. And last, the most common secondary tests include chest CT, stress test, and left and or right heart catheterization.